we're going to study definite integrals, which are defined as limits of Riemann sums and their properties. All right, so let me start by defining definite integrals. So let f be a function over some interval a to b, then the definite integral of f from a to b, which is denoted by this symbol, here is the n going to infinity limit of the Riemann sum that we introduced in the previous video. So more precisely is the limit as n goes going to infinity of the summation from i running from 1 to n of f of xi, where xi is the right endpoint of the rectangles, times delta x, where delta x is the width of the rectangles. And if this limit exists, because it could happen that it does not exist, then we say that the function is integrable over this interval, and you can prove that every continuous function over a to b is integrable, and in fact it does not need to be continuous as long as it only has jump discontinuities over the interval, it is still integrable. All right, so a few remarks. Uh, first, just a bit of notation. So the thing inside the integral sign here, f of x, we call the integrand. And a and b here, the two numbers, we call the limits of integration. So the lower one we say is the lower limit and the upper one the upper limit, which of course makes sense. Now, uh, you should note as well that this symbol here, this elongated s, the integral sign, is the same that we uh, used before when we talk about antiderivatives or indefinite integral. And there's a reason, as we'll see when we study fundamental theorem of calculus, the two are related. But when you have a and b, when you have limits of integration, it means a totally different thing. It means the definite integral or the limit of the Riemann sum. While if you don't have the limits of integration, it means the indefinite integral, which is the antiderivative, the general antiderivative of the function. All right, so what else uh, should I say? Well, one thing that is important to note as well, which is another difference between this symbol and the antiderivative, is that this whole expression here is not a function, is it's a number, right? You're calculating the limit of a Riemann sum, so it really gives you a number. It's not a function of x. If you don't have the limits of integration, you're calculating the general antiderivative of f of x, which is itself a function of x. So it's very different. All right, and the last thing I want to mention here is that in my definition, I used the right point rule. So I took xi here to be the right point, right end point of the rectangles. But we could here use uh, any other formulation for the Riemann sum, the left point rule, the midpoint rule. In fact, we could take xi to be any point in the intervals between xi minus 1 and xi to define the Riemann sum. And it would not matter because when you take the limit, you would always get the same answer. So it does not matter. So we may as well use the right point rule because it's the easiest to work with. Let me give you an example of a definite integral. So suppose that I write the integral from 1 to 2 of the function x squared plus 1. So what am I doing here? So I'm integrating from 1 to 2. So my interval here is 1 to 2. So I can now calculate the objects that enter into the definition of the definite integral. So delta x, which stands for the width of the rectangles, will be b minus a over n. But in this case, b is 2 a is 1, so I end up with 1 over n. The second object I will enter is the function at xi, so I first need to evaluate the right endpoints xi, so is a plus i delta x. a is 1, delta x is 1 over n, so I end up with this expression for the right endpoints, and then I can substitute back in the definition of a definite integral, and this symbol here will stand for the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation with i running from 1 to n of f of xi, but I've just calculated that xi is 1 plus i over n, times delta x, which I've calculated to be 1 over n. And I can actually evaluate the function here, so I'm given a specific function. I'm integrating the function x squared plus 1. So I can replace that by the value of the function x squared plus 1 when the argument x is replaced by 1 plus i over n. So what I'll get is the limit as n goes to infinity of my summation, where here I'm replacing x by 1 plus i over n, so I get 1 plus i over n square plus 1 times delta x, which is 1 over n. So this symbol here for the definite integral of x squared plus 1 from 1 to 2 stands for this complicated expression, which is the limit of the corresponding Riemann sum. All right, so what I want to do in the rest of this video is study various properties of definite integrals. But since I introduced Riemann sum as being a way of calculating the area under the graph of a function, it makes sense to start by studying the geometric properties of definite integrals. So let's, let, let's look first at case number one, where I have a function which is positive over the interval a to b. So what is the definite integral calculating? 
Well, this is the case that we studied. So we've already seen that the Riemann sum was approximating the area under the graph here, and that taking the limit would calculate the true area under the graph. So in other words, the integral of f of x from a to b calculates the area that is shaded in blue here. All right, what about case number two? So if I have a function which is negative over the interval, so I could still shade the area between the graph of that function and the x-axis. But it turns out that the definite integral is not actually calculating this, but very close to this. So if you look at this, what happens is that the right-hand side here is such that, well, the function here will be negative for any point on the interval. So the right-hand side will give me a calculation of the area, but with an overall minus sign. Right? So in other words, the definite integral from, of f of x from a to b, if f of x is less or equal to zero over the interval, will not give me the area that is shaded in blue, but minus the area. Uh, another way of saying that is that if you are interested in calculating the area here, what you want to calculate is not the definite integral of the function, but minus the definite integral of that function. Now, in the general case, where the function is partly positive and partly negative over the interval, then uh, you can kind of apply the same reasoning, and what you'll get is the following. So, for example, in this case, I have three different areas. So let me call the first one R1, second one R2, and third one R3. Now by the same argument, you see that every time that the function, so over every sub-interval where the function is positive, the definite integral will calculate the area, and over the intervals where the function is negative, the definite integral will calculate minus the area. So what we say is that the definite integral of the function from A to B calculates something called the net area which is exactly what I said. So it's basically adding up the different areas, but with a plus sign if it's above the x-axis and a minus sign if it's below the x-axis. So in this case, that would give me minus r1 plus r2 minus r3. And another way of saying the same thing is that if instead of calculating uh, the net area, you are really interested in calculating the true area, namely r1 plus r2 plus r3, what you want to calculate is not the definite integral of the function, rather it is the definite integral of the absolute value of the function. All right, so I'll leave that as an exercise to show that this is indeed correct, so that the integral of the absolute value of the function does give you the true area, uh, regardless of whether the regions are above or below the x-axis, and we'll see how this goes in class. All right, so here's now a bunch of properties that follow directly from the definition of definite integrals. So the first one is the statement that the integral from a to b of a function is equal to minus the integral from b to a. Now, why is that true? Well, if you look at the definition, exchanging a and b will change the sign of delta x. So in other words, delta x will go to minus delta x, so it will change an overall sign for the definite integral. The second property is also pretty uh, obvious, it's the statement that if you integrate a function from a to a, so the same point for both the upper and the, the lower limit of integration, then you get zero, and that's clear from the definition, because if b is, equal to, b is equal to a, then delta x is equal to zero, and the whole summation goes to zero. All right, the third one is the statement that if you integrate a, a function times a constant, you can actually pull the constant out of the integral. Again, that follows from the definition, because and the definition here, f of xi, will be replaced by c of f, f of xi, and then by properties of summation, you can pull the c out, and also outside of the limit, because it's a constant. And similarly, the last property here, which is that the integral of a sum of functions is a sum of the integrals, just follows from properties of the summation for exactly the same thing as before. If you have a summation of a sum, it's the same thing as the sum of the summations. All right, so I have four more properties here of definite integrals that can be deduced from the geometric interpretation. So the first one is the statement that the integral from a to b of the function 1 is equal to b minus a. So why is that true? Well, the function 1, if you sketch its graph, is just a line y equals to 1. So the integral from a to b of this function is just calculating the area under the graph. But this is just a rectangle of width b minus a and height 1. So its area will be given by b minus a. All right, the second property is, is, is very interesting here. So it's the statement that if I integrate a function from a to b, this is the same as first integrating from a to c, and then from c to b for arbitrary 
uh, c. So why is that true? Well, let's just look at a function. So I have some function here. I have two points a and b, and what the definite integral is calculating is the area under the curve, or more precisely, the net area of the curve was not if the function was not positive. But okay, in this case, it's just the area. Now what I'm saying is that if I pick an arbitrary c, so let's say c here, then if I first integrate from a to c, I'll be calculating this area. And then if I integrate from c to b, I'll be calculating this area. And if I add up the two, so this is what I call uh, the area in blue, and this was the area in red. So if I add up these two, then indeed I'll get the area in orange. So that follows directly from the geometric interpretation. And in fact, C does not have to be between A and B. If you put C outside, you get the exact same interpretation as long as you take into account the property that we saw in the previous slide, which is that the integral from A to B of a function is the same as minus the integral from B to A. All right, and the last two properties are about uh, even and odd function. So if a function is even, then its integral from minus A to A is equal to twice the integral from 0 to A. So why is that true? Well, an even function is a function that looks exactly the same on both sides of the y-axis. So if I integrate between two points, minus a and a, so this is an exactly the same distance on both sides of the y-axis, so I'm calculating the area here, the net area under the curve, but it's the same thing on both sides of the y-axis, right? If I call a the area on the left side of the y-axis and a the area on the right side of the y-axis, what this integral is calculating is a plus a, which is indeed equal to twice a, where a is now just the integral on the right-hand side, so the definite integral from 0 to a of the function. Now, my examples here are always for positive functions, but it works exactly the same way for arbitrary functions, as long as you take into account the signs for the net area. And the last statement is about odd functions. So if a function is odd, then its integral from minus a to a is always 0, regardless of the function, as long as it's odd. That's very, very interesting. And why is that so? Well, an odd function is a function that looks exactly the same on both sides of the y-axis, but with an opposite sign. So by the same argument as above, so if I'm integrating between minus a and a, so two points which are exactly the same distance from the y-axis, then again on both sides I'll get the exact same area, but now the definite integral is calculating the net area. So on one side it'll come with a plus sign, and the other side will come with a minus sign, so I will always get exactly zero. So that's a very, very useful property. And finally, I have four comparison properties that are very important, but they're a little more subtle, but they can all be deduced from the geometry gap. So the first one is about positive functions. So if f of x is greater or equal to zero over the interval, then the integral is also greater or equal to zero. Why is that true? Well, if I have a function which is greater or equal to zero, then I know by the geometric property that the integral here is calculating the area, or it's calculating the net area in general, but now it will have a positive sign because the function is greater or equal to zero, so clearly the integral will always be positive. Now the second one is a generalization of the first one. If I have two functions now, which is such, which are such that f of x is always greater or equal to g of x over the interval, then the integral of f of x will also be greater or equal than the integral of g of x. Why is that true? Well, if I have f of x, so let's say that this is f of x, and I assume that it's greater or equal to g of x over the interval. Well, again, I just have to understand what the integrals are calculating geometrically. So the integral of f of x over this interval is calculating this area, while the integral of g of x is calculating this area. So because f of x is always greater or equal to g of x, then the area in red will also be greater or equal than the area in orange, which is exactly the statement here for the definite integrals. Now the third one is even more subtle. So it is the following statement. So if I have a function which is less uh, or equal to capital M and greater or equal to a constant little m over the interval, then I have this particular set of inequalities. Why is that true? Well, let me put my function here. And let's take a capital M as being something like that. So this is this will be the function y equals capital M. And then, say, little m will be something like this. So y equals little m. 
So clearly the value of the function f of x is always between little m and capital M over the interval a to b. Now what is the integral of f of x calculating? Well, it's calculating this area here. But from the geometry, what I see is that the area in blue will always be greater or equal than the area in red. But the area in red, this is just a rectangle. The width is b minus a and the height is little m. So its area is m times b minus a. So that's exactly what I have on the left-hand side here. So the statement, the left statement, is saying that the area in blue will be greater or equal than the area in red. On the other hand, I also have the area in, say, dark blue here, which will be again a rectangle with width b minus a, but high capital M. And now I know that the area in, in the original blue, the area under the function f of x, will be less than the area in dark blue, which is the second inequality here. So again, this looks complicated, but if you understand it geometrically, it just follows directly from the definition of definite integrals. All right, and the last one is about absolute value. So it's saying, it's saying that the absolute value of an integral is always less or equal than the integral of the absolute value. So this one I will leave as an exercise to prove that or deduce that from the geometric picture, and we will do that in class as well. All right, so we've seen tons of properties of definite integrals. This is great, but what is really important now is that you get comfortable with these properties, and most importantly, that you know how to use them to evaluate definite integrals. So we'll do plenty of examples of that in class.